Welcome back, everyone. Thanks so much to our break sponsor, Lambda Lakes, and hopefully you were all able to catch their special presentation on sensory evaluation of flavor and taste. I also hope that you all found the breakout sessions valuable and that you enjoyed our various networking activities. But before we start our next session, let's check in on the poll and see how you all have voted. All right, pulling that up here. So which of the following would best help your menu more whole intact grains? Well, we definitely have a close call here, but it looks like greater availability of product came in at 31% and then training tools for staff and preparation right behind it at 29%. Wow, what a close call there. Thank you all for participating in that. It's always interesting to see how we can look at whole grains and what you're doing in your operations. And now building on our conversation around whole grains and deliciousness from the breakout session earlier today, we're going to take a more macro look at one of the biggest opportunities for advancing public health through a sustained focus on carbohydrate quality in restaurant menu innovation. We'll get a top notch research update on the impact of carbohydrate on health and we'll explore menu strategies for incorporating these wholesome ingredients. To get us started, I would like to welcome Greg Drescher, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Industry Leadership at the Culinary Institute of America to the stage to give us a preview of the CIA's newest menus of change resource, the Carbohydrate Flip, which is currently in development. Greg, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Earlier in the conference, <clears throat> we talked about the health and environmental imperatives behind plant-forward menu innovation, captured in our new report, Plant Forward by the Numbers. We heard from Data Central that nearly 50% of consumers now either eat less meat or no meat or aspire to do so in the future, and that as many as 80% of consumers surveyed said they are at least open to eating less meat. We discussed the need to support plant-forward uh, innovation with a reimagined approach to culinary strategy, as consumers aren't typically willing to accept less delicious food just because it might be healthy or sustainable. In partial response to that need, the CIA released a few years back the protein flip, which describes a strategy to flip the role that animal and plant-based foods typically play on our menus and on our plates. This fall, the CIA will be releasing a new resource we're calling the carbohydrate flip, here illustrated by the potential of fresh cut fruit to substitute for some of the added sugar that so defines American food in 2020. The carbohydrate flip will build on our recent work with Harvard around the plant forward concept. Understanding that soda, chips and fries are also plant sourced, it will highlight pathways towards advancing carbohydrate quality and menus more focused on whole, minimally processed, slow metabolizing foods. Unfortunately, refined, fast metabolizing carbs are still foundational to many U.S. restaurant menus. Millions of our customers love them, from hot fluffy pancakes and soft hamburger buns to mounds of French fries that fill plates across the country, all washed down with cold, refreshing, sugary beverages. Now, to be serious about making progress towards carbohydrate quality, we need to first be clear-eyed about what's at stake. We are now a nation, unfortunately, generally in poor health, in large part because of our food choices. Scientists project that about 75% of chronic diseases are attributable to diet and lifestyle. 42% of Americans are now obese, and that number is projected to climb to over 50% within 10 years. 114 million Americans have diabetes or pre-diabetes. 122 million Americans have some form of heart disease and an estimated 530,000 Americans die each year as a result of poor diets, a number that is now surely higher with the COVID-19 targeting individuals with chronic linked, with diet-linked chronic disease. In addition, the economic impacts of related healthcare costs are massive. With this picture, it's hard to see how a post-pandemic business as usual model for our industry is sustainable long-term without serious disruptive innovation. Fortunately, on the carbohydrate front, promising innovation is popping up everywhere. Our Healthy Kids Collaborative shares best practices among leaders in school nutrition, where a substantial focus on whole grains is, at least for now, mandated. 
This younger generation, who for the most part are now accustomed to eating lots of whole grains, are the future customers of our industry. Chefs and dining directors in our Menus of Change University Research Collaborative are also driving innovation around carbohydrate quality in, in the college and university sector, from breakfast menus to healthier beverage offerings. One way to think about the opportunities around the carbohydrate flip is in the area of sweets, specifically what we call the dessert flip. Instead of forcing our customers to choose between, say, a whole slice of cheesecake with a single strawberry as a garnish, or on the other hand, just having a plain bowl of berries, what if we could offer a, a dessert with three or four fabulous bites of cheesecake and a generous portion of berries or other fresh fruit? Or desserts created entirely from a, hearth, a healthy market basket, from dark uh, chocolate and fruit to whole grains, nuts, and yogurt. Next week, we'll have a, a seminar entirely devoted to this strategy. The Mediterranean region is a good place to look for inspiration around healthy ca carbs. <clears throat> Olive oil, of course, is the foundation of flavor in the traditional Mediterranean diet, such as with this hummus preparation. The menus of change principles call for a healthy fat versus a low fat approach to menu innovation. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of baggage left over from the low fat orth orthodoxy of the 1980s and 90s witness the ubiquitous low-fat low bran muffin that sadly lives on. Tabbouli, with its cracked bulgur wheat, chopped parsley, and olive oil, is a delicious way to enjoy whole grains. In Greece, on the island of Crete, whole grain barley rusks get hydrated with some water, then topped with a pile of chopped tomatoes, some good fruity Cretan olive oil, and fresh feta for a truly memorable salad. The south of France with its Niçoise salad suggests ways to healthfully include limited amounts of potatoes in our menus. Here's a small quantity of cold cooked potatoes take their place alongside green beans, other vegetables, some anchovies and egg and olive oil for a slow metabolizing lunch. As customers, we can relish that occasional order of fries or similar indulgences if our day in day out default choices reflect higher carbohydrate quality. Pasta, of course, is central to the Italian Mediterranean kitchen. Here is a whole grain pasta tossed with pesto and chopped greens. As you know, the pasta category is seeing a lot of innovation now, not only with whole grains, but legume flour as well. It's good to know that regular pasta, if you cook it al dente, uh, you can substantially improve its health profile, making it a source of slower releasing carbs. Other world food cultures offer similarly valuable culinary strategies to advance carbohydrate quality, including Asia. In this salad, soba noodles made from buckwheat flour make an excellent menu addition when paired with vegetables and other Asian flavors. One of the great accelerators uh, of late for healthy carbs has been grain bowls and power bowls. With foundational ingredients ranging from quinoa to chickpeas, these plant forward bowls are an easy way to enjoy healthy carbs. Here, lentils are paired with small amounts of salmon and other vegetables. Lentils also figure into the menu mix for bowls at sweet green, uh, as does wild rice, sweet potatoes, and roasted sesame tofu seen in this slide. Chad Robertson's breads at Tartine remind us of the pivotal importance of technique in turning whole grains into an irresistible taste experience. Klaus Meyer's uh, rye breads remind us how much European baking traditions from the Nordic countries to Germany have to offer in the hunt for great flavor in healthy grain experiences. On the other side of the globe, Indian and Asian traditions of whole grain flatbreads are vastly underrepresented in our industry. And finally, whole grains and other healthy carbs benefit from natural flavor affinities. Roasted mushrooms on this whole wheat thin crust pizza make this recipe a keeper. In the near term, there are a lot of ideas in our 24 Menus of Change principles around carbohydrate quality, which you can find at our Menus of Change website. And we'll alert everyone when our carbohydrate flip is available for viewing this fall. So thank you all and back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Greg. And now that I'm salivating over the dishes you just shared, it is my pleasure to welcome back to the stage David Jenkins, who is University Professor and Canada Research Chair in the Departments of Nutritional Sciences and Medicine at the University of Toronto. 
He has served on committees in Canada and in the United States that formulated nutritional guidelines for the treatment of diabetes and recommendations for fiber and macronutrients. David, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much for this invitation and I'm, I'm glad to be here with you all um, at a distance as it were. Um, so we're going to talk about carbohydrate quality, which I think is tremendously important as we move forward into this century uh, for a number of reasons that I think will, will be obvious to you as we, uh, as we go forward. So this is me, David Jenkins, the next slide, please. Um, I've had a, a, a number of conflicts of interest over the last three years, uh, working with a number of food companies, many of them of whom have been very helpful in supplying foods of different kinds for our dietary trials. Next slide, please. Basically, I think there's a general agreement that there are certain factors that determine the quality of carbohydrate foods. I think most of you are aware of fiber, especially cereal fiber, which seems to be particularly good and which we tend to refine out with white flour products. Whole grains where you've got intact flours are also good. Intact grains, bulgur, pumpernickel bread, you know, the sort of very hard bread that if you drop it, it'll break your foot. Uh, those sort of bricks of, of, of bread contain hard whole grains and they're digested slowly. And then there's the glycemic index, which really is the, the mark of the rate at which the food, the carbohydrate food is digested. Next slide, please. I just want to remind you, if, if you need to be reminded, that diabetes, which is one of the, the reasons for our big interest in carbohydrate, is growing rem dramatically. Um, even at the turn of this century, we've got up to 10% people with diabetes in certain parts of the US. And the same is happening globally with a massive increase in type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. So we've got these tools, these different types of, uh, of, of carbohydrate quality indicators. The glycemic index is the one that is perhaps least well known. And so I'd like to just discuss perhaps how it works, because that will give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about the rate of carbohydrate digestion. Next slide, please. If you think of the gut, the stomach, as you can see at the top, and then the small intestine going down. If you've got on the, the left-hand side, you can see the high fiber meal, the low glycemic index meal, releasing its carbohydrate digestion products slowly. And on the right-hand side, you can see the rapid digestion of very rapidly digested carbohydrate foods, giving their carbohydrate uh, into the bloodstream through the gut very quickly. So at the bottom, you can see a a relatively flat rise in blood glucose, as opposed to a high rise in blood glucose, which will also challenge the pancreas by the secretion of insulin. So uh, a much different sort of picture. So two different types of foods. Um, Acabose is a drug, you can see that, 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 that does the same thing. It slows absorption of carbohydrate. Sticky fibers do the same thing, and so do low glycemic index foods. Next slide, please. If you look at the stop nidum trial where they looked at acabose, which slows carbohydrate absorption pharmacologically, you can see that it prevented um, heart attacks uh, by almost 50%. Next slide, please. So there is a big link with heart disease and there's a link with diabetes too. These were shown by Dr. Walt Willett's group, uh, or I uh, showed this with low glycemic index and serial fiber intakes in women. Um, and the risk of type 2 diabetes this is a nurse's study over a 10 year period. And you can see very nicely uh, going from low to medium to high glycemic index at the front, the, the stepwise rise in risk of diabetes. And then you can see on the side the, the effect of cereal fiber, which is also protective, and what that does. And you can see that rise at the far corner on the uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the big effect that you get um, when you have both a high uh, glycemic index diet and a low cereal fiber diet. They showed again very nicely with Simon Liu and, and Bort Willis group, the effect of BMI. So if you're slim 
on the left hand side, BMI less than 23, it doesn't much matter. You can eat what sort of foods you like within reason. But once you get like the rest of us in your between 23 uh, and 30 um, BMI, then you've got to worry because as your glycemic load increases the amount of total carbohydrate times the uh, glycemic index in your diet, then you get into trouble. Next slide, please. So are there foods that you can, you can focus on if you're in the culinary business and if you're just wanting to make foods at home that are useful, are there certain foods that we've neglected? Well, one example, one, one easy example for you, and it's a sort of take home message, is that the beans are good. The beans are good for the heart. Uh, they're good, the beans are good for diabetes too. And as you can see here, this is the blood glucose response to most carbohydrate foods, breads, breakfast cereals, tubers, root vegetables, etc. And then at the bottom, you can see um, mixed beans, beans, relatively low blood glucose. So these foods, uh, I don't know whether you use lentils, whether you use chickpeas, these foods given liberally um, in your diet are one of the low glycemic index foods that will reduce the blood glucose rise, prevent the risk of diabetes and of heart disease um, in the future. Next slide, please. So are they new? Well, they're new to us in many ways because people don't eat beans, even in Boston. I'm quite sure they don't eat many Boston baked beans, but they were once old foods. And this is the bean eater um, from uh, 1580 to 1590, um, uh, painted, well, well known, well respected, um, showing that beans were something that were once very common in our diets in days when people were somewhat more healthy and where diabetes and heart disease was very rare. Uh, now slide, please. So to conclude, we're suggesting that you increase the fiber um, with cereal fiber and whole wheat products in your diets um, and in the foods that you produce. We suggest that you use whole grains, um, whole grains, bulgur, pumpernickel breads. These sort of foods are useful um, to be had and that you, you think of darts where you can, and, and dishes where you can cook beans, beans with pasta, um, where you use things like berries and temperate climate fruit, which are also low glycemic index. These are the sort of foods, these are the building blocks, if you like, of a healthy carbohydrate diet. But beans especially, because they're so neglected and we haven't been talking about them enough in the last, uh, last few years. Uh, beans are good. I mean, we make hummus, hummus is very popular. Uh, chickpeas, lentils, one can do all sorts of dishes. Lentil soup are uh, considered to be a delicacy with many. Uh, these are the sort of foods that I think you really have to promote rather more than we do. Thank you. Thanks so much, David, for turning the science into something that we can use in our day to day. And next up, for those of you who missed our breakout session, Carbohydrate Quality and Whole Grains, I'm going to welcome back Nana Meyer, founder of the Grain School Program at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. But before she joins us live on stage, first, let's check out this video on her fantastic program. You're like, oh, it's just grains. There can't be that much to know about grains. It's not just grain. I learned a lot of new techniques with different foods and cultures and actually realized the like community in food culture is much bigger and broader than I had originally thought. There was practical hands-on. There was also advocacy. There was chemistry, which was really exciting. There was diet, nutrition, culture, and just a ton more. Grain school always starts with farming because without the farmers, there would be no grain school. You just kind of see people coming together that aren't normally together. You build kind of a family. It's a grain school family. It's about making connections, learning from others, not to use the word educational, but it's educational. It is such an atypical course. It's not really a conference. We still keep it as an academic course and it can be taken by uh, students at the university, undergrad and graduate students for credit or not for credit. I met a mentor and I learned how to you know, make tortillas and that was really cool to get back to, you know, the grassroots way we should be um, interacting with food. So it's a, on a different level than just sitting in a lecture and like learning about it. And it may open a door to something that 
you didn't know you were interested in? I think this could honestly be for anyone. You do not have to be interested in the field of nutrition um, or farming. Like This truly can apply to anyone. We have established this tiered learning uh, where the students are learning from the community members. They learn from each other. It's important that they see where food comes from and that it takes a long time to produce, but how much better it tastes, how much better it is for you. I like to eat good anyway, but it did refine and put like, you know, help me understand what I'm actually doing a little bit better. And there's still so much to learn. Boosting our, our nutrition and our diets with fiber is going to be critical for long-term health and, and make sure that we are rebuilding our microbiome. And grain school taught me a lot about that, about how, I guess, to appreciate what we have. I thought the hands-on application piece of it was really valuable. Not only give you the knowledge, but they put it in your hands. So you get to take something away from it. So when you go home, you now have all these new recipes and insights. I uh, really opened my eyes and changed my perspective. I know there's going to be a lot of surprises, but the biggest one is probably that grain school in the future will go to the field. Uh, that, that brings you know, probably more of the hands-on experience to students and internship opportunities and apprenticeship opportunities. Grain school really exceeded my expectations, I would say. I think it was just a whole well-rounded experience. Um, I got what I was seeking and more. So uh, it's just the beginning. We're scratching the surface here, but it's, it's really important. And it's been um, pretty impactful. I see familiar faces and you see them in the community and you smile at them and you're like, I saw you at grain school. <laughs> so it's, it's really a cool experience. I would highly recommend it. I would definitely try it. Everyone is a student at grain school. Thank you, Menus of Change and the Culinary Institute of America. It's really an honor to be here with you. I have a short disclosure to make. Please, let, next slide. Uh, the antique combines in the movie from Grain School belong to our farm in Avondale, Colorado. And yes, we do grow a small selection of heritage grains. Next. We need to eat our grains whole, unsifted and unrefined. Next. Have a look at this image. Refined grains lack the bran and the germ, which strips the grain off most of its nutrient-rich components, such as dietary fiber, vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, such as polyphenols, protein, and single amino acids. This is the same for small grains, wheat, rye, barley, and oats, and corn, regardless of the type of corn, flour, flint, or dent. Let's eat them whole. Next slide, please. Grain is the staff of life and the food of the gods as the Aztecs meant that the tortilla and corn represented. The history and culture of wheat and barley, quinoa, buckwheat, amaranth and millet and corn spans the entire globe and dates back thousands of years to the beginning of agriculture. They are diverse in flavors and textures, nutrition and culinary opportunities. Their genetic diversity is a key to our food system's resiliency. Next slide. When freshly milled and crafted into slow fermented sourdough bread or nixtamalized and hand pressed into fresh corn tortillas, these grains explode with flavor, texture, nutrition. They're easier to digest for those with um, sensitivities and they nourish the microbiome. Culinary traditions cannot be just lost like this. It hurts our society. Next slide. America's fiber gap contributes significantly to diet-related chronic diseases, premature de death and weakened immunity. We must change this message and all of the culinary deliveries around the whole grain. Refining grains is really unsustainable. Imagine one acre of wheat. Refining removes around 30% of its nutrition. It might go to animals or somewhere else, but let's think about this. Then consider climate change and the projections of decreased production and reduced nutrient density per acre. We are not aligning sustainable production with healthy eating when using white flour, white pasta, or white rice. Grain biodiversity offers many ecosystem services, especially in climate extremes. And if aligned with selection and breeding techniques with scientists who understand the importance of genetic diversity and how to protect it, we can promote win-win-win 
solutions and ensure resiliency. Next slide. But grains go even deeper. They have made our, up our sustenance for thousands of years. They are sacred. The grain chain is complex and interdependent, becoming part of this grain artisan value chain as farmers, millers, malsters, bakers, brewers, distillers, chefs, and educators is the most unexpected journey and simply transformational. Next. So are you interested in getting on the grain train? If so, this map uh, was produced by the Artisan Grain Collective and shows what is going on in grain where you live. You can jump on uh, in many places of, of the United States. For us, with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, Grain School launched the Colorado Grain Chain, a business-to-business -business organization with focus on whole heritage and Colorado-based based grains uh, and products connected through cooperation, regenerative agriculture, and artisanship. As Grain School is going online starting in 2021, it can be accessed from anywhere in the world. While we focus regionally with Grain School in the field in Colorado in partnership with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union and the Colorado Grain Chain. Next slide, please. And remember, you know, there's so much about grain. Uh, grain literacy leads to grain citizenship. So as you are entering the grain chain, think about, you know, where are you getting your flour from? Is there a story to tell regionally in your university, in your restaurant, that ties it back to your place uh, and ties the education eventually to the consumer that first learns about all of this ingrained literacy and gets involved with baking at home and becomes a grain citizen. And remember, eat your grains whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nana, for all of the inspiration. I would like to now bring Greg back up to the stage for a brief time with some Q&A. And Greg, you took us on a trip around the globe. Nana, you inspired us with all of these delicious baked goods. But one question I have is because we've heard over the weeks about how to best communicate with our guests about better food choices. That is leading with flavor and other attributes versus health. So my question is, how does this apply to winning more fans for whole intact grains and other healthy carbohydrates? And Greg, do you want to take that first? Sure. <clears throat> you know, I think I think in many respects, it really starts with our attention and what we focus on. And there's a parallel here to chefs um, sort of embracing the world of vegetables because the, the prize has always been um, the animal kingdom in terms of, of providing value on the plate. And so much of professional cooking is built around that. But I think in the last 10 years of chefs have discovered vegetables, a number of chefs, Jose Andres and others have said, oh my God, there's way more to learn in the plant kingdom there than there is working with just a handful of animal proteins. Um, and I think the same thing is that, that for a lot of chefs still, whole grains is kind of, seems like a burden. It's sort of like, oh God, I have to have some whole grains or you know so forth, it, as opposed to a world of discovery. And that's just, a, that's a focus of, it's it's lack of focus, um, <clears throat> and it's it's a, you know, it's indicative of a need to sort of get into that that is Nana says the grain get on the grain train or get into the world of grain mm -hmm. discovery, and you realize um, how much is there. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, we do have a question from the audience uh, relating to the grain train and the grain map. Um, Nana, do you know if there's something similar in the UK? for our audience to access? There is there is a um, grain lab, I be believe it's called, the grain lab. Uh, we are called the grain school. Uh, there's the bread lab, there's craft at Chatham University. There's the main grain alliance. There is um, various, various centers around you know, the US and in the UK, I think it's called the grain lab. They started education in the UK. Similarly, you know, with a lot of this hands-on work and uh, baking with whole grain. There's also the sourdough school uh, in the UK, which is mostly online. Uh, just a phenomenal group of people with, you know, evidence-based approaches to sourdough integration. Uh, there's so much science in this, but the science merging with the culinary world uh, is just, it's, it's an active kitchen, right? It's 
you can't say too many chefs in the kitchen. It's just incredible what happens when, when people come together and, and we mix microbes. <laughs> the outcomes are good. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah. and, and Nana, I mean, your work inspires the chefs and bakers of tomorrow and anybody else who is at home. So how can we get chefs that are outside of your program to think about carbohydrates more holistically across the menu and in terms of both deliciousness and health? How do we make it the new norm? You know, there, it's a journey. It will take some time to work through the menus. It's not easy to make those transitions, uh, but it's, it's absolutely possible. Uh, I think there's a lot to learn we offer grain school online you know this was before even the pandemic we knew we would be able to do five years of grain school in that kind of environment which is so much work uh, to put it together mm. and then uh, the the break from it is now that we're developing the online component uh, online is is nice but it's just not the same so hopefully wherever you know everybody is in the region you can find some kind of an active grain uh, grain group, uh, you certainly can find some artisan bakers to start. Uh, integrating you know, whole grains in grain bowls and uh, protein flip, I think uh, the Culinary Institute will have a lot of answers. And then hopefully here in our environment, we'll have a grain school test kitchen. So we would love to work with you and develop your menu. Yeah. Oh my gosh, our audience is fully engaged here with so many questions. I wish that we can get them all answered. I'm going to take one though um, for you, Greg. And can you elaborate on your previous comment that pasta cooked al dente is better than more fully cooked pasta? And does that apply to all pastas? Uh, it, it applies to all pastas. The, 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 um, uh, it, it, it's most applicable to refined white flour pasta because that's where you have your biggest risk. Mm -hmm. um, overcooking whole grain pasta or legume, pa legume flour pasta is less of an issue, but this is actually true with a number of carbohydrates. So it's the same thing with potatoes. So, you know, it's easy to say this food is good for you or bad for you, but in fact, within the world of potatoes or within the world of pasta, there are all kinds of nuanced choices. Um, and so the, the starch, the structure of the starch changes if the pasta is slightly undercooked. And of course, that is the default way of cooking pasta in, in Italy. And so that makes a big difference. So if you have on your menu, you know, some, um, you know, traditional pasta, some whole grain pasta, some legume flour pasta, and you cook the, the, the regular pasta al dente, you know, you, you've offered uh, more, more options there, all of which are, are healthier. Um, you know, one strategy I was sort of struck by years ago, I was talking to the CEO of Compass uh, in Japan and he wanted to introduce more whole grains to the Japanese. And of course, the Japanese have a very healthy diet and they have very long life expectancy, but they do eat a lot of white rice. So that's an area they could improve on. Mm -hmm. And so he realized that he said, I, I can't just take the white rice away and put brown rice out. So what he did is in these uh, corporate cafeterias, they created rice bars. So the white rice was still there, brown rice was there, but then they had mixed grain um, uh, cookers and what he found was that almost everybody defaulted to something other than just white rice. And that's a nice way to bring people into the conversation. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, there's, there's also the sort of choice architecture piece to the conversation that we need to think about as well. And you both, I mean, this conversation could go on and on. And um, with that said though, our time is running short, but we will look forward to seeing the new carbohydrate flip coming out soon this fall. And now I want to take a final moment to thank you, Nana, thank you, Greg, and David, who could not join us for the Q&A today, thank you as well. And all right, we are going to take a final look at our poll results. But before we do that, here's a quick recap of our next and final event, the networking reception. Similar to the break earlier, we have a range of ways for you to engage with everyone who is also attending today from our peers and suppliers to the presenters. The slides that you're seeing right now will show you where to find everything. The activities include one-on-one -on -one networking and our sponsor expo. This week's networking topic is, how are you communicating to your customers about the impact of their food choices on their health and the health of the planet? And I'll remind you 
that you are entered into a raffle each week when you participate. And if you attend and participate all six weeks, you'll have a chance to win registration and travel to next year's conference, hopefully when we can gather in person in Hyde Park. And last, we want to make sure that you get a chance to offer your opinion on our virtual series. So please fill out the survey, which you can access at this link or in the link that we'll send you via email. We hope you'll also join us next Wednesday when we take a deeper look on how the menus of change principles are working throughout our industry from K-12 to university food service and from healthcare to public health policy. You'll find the full schedule at themenusofchange.org. And now let's all go back over to the polls and see what our final results are. So as a reminder, the question is, which of the following would best help your menu, with, uh, sorry, would be best help you menu more whole intact grains. Very similar to our results that we talked about earlier with greater availability of products leading with 33%. Thank you all again, and we hope to see you back here next week. <laughs>